Hello, welcome to our webinar on food security in the US and worldwide. What the data tell us about hunger and policy, brought to you by CIFER, the Council on Food, Agricultural and Resource Economics. My name is Gal Hoffman and I'm the CIFER board chair and professor at Rutgers University. It is my pleasure to be moderating today's webinar. It's CIFER mission to translate high-level research and knowledge to a diverse audience that includes policymaker, elected officials, and federal administrators. When we demonstrate the value of the profession to these groups, the Council increases public appreciation to research extension, outreach, academic programs in agriculture and applied economics. Before we get started, I wanted to provide some background on today's topic. Food security is a fundamental human need that the U.S. has long sought to protect, using various programs guided by key metrics that reflect and contribute to international measurement and global actions. For these reasons, CIFER put together a series of webinars on this topic with the current webinar being the third of three CIFR webinars on the subject. If you haven't seen them, I urge you to watch the others, which offered a deep dive into US food security, was presented last November, then global food security, which was presented in January. Both videos are on CIFR website. For this month's webinar, the current webinar, we take a unified view of the U.S. global food and nutrition security in terms of three dimensions. The first, energy balance and unwanted weight loss or gain associated with periods of stress. The second, the experiencing of food insecurity in the sense of skipping meals or going to bed hungry due to lack of money to buy food. And the third, access and healthy diets availability and affordability of sufficiently nutritious food. All three are interrelated and different from people's diet quality and health outcomes. This webinar describes the metrics and findings for these three concepts using the US and globally to guide discussions of how this data can drive action. CIFR has assembled a panel of four experts to discuss this work, starting with William Masters. William Masters is a professor of food economics and policy in the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts University, where he leads the food prices for nutrition projects that computes the cost and affordability of healthy diet and the IMMANA IMANA Fellowship Program, among other initiatives. Alisa Coleman Jensen joined the Economic Research Service, ERS, in 2009. She is a team leader of U.S. food security research at ERS and is the lead author of USDA's annual report, Household Food Security in the United States. Her research focuses on the measurement and determinants of food insecurity. Park Weld is a professor at the Friedman School at Tufts University. His general research focuses is on US food and nutrition policy, consumer economics, and federal food assistance programs. Current and past research includes a supplemental nutrition assistance program, Healthy Incentives Pilots, HIP, the geography of local food retail, federal commodity checkoff programs, in food and beverage marketing to children. Lisa Moon is president and CEO of the Global Food Banking Network, GFN, an international development organization committed to nursing the world's hungry through uniting and advancing food banking organization in more than 40 countries. But before we start, we want to explain how to ask questions during the webinar and highly encourage that to have you, the audience, engage. During the webinar, 
you can put questions to one or all of the speakers by typing it into the box in the control display accessed by clicking on the question drop down as shown in the slide and sending it to the organizer. Now, I'll hand the webinar over to Will Masters, who will start us off. Will, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gal, and thanks to everybody for joining. Really uh, appreciate your participation, the questions you'll ask, comments you'll enter in the Q&A. I want to start this off in a way that I hope will introduce really nicely for Alicia's points about how the USDA now measures food security, followed by Park Wilde on these qualitative dimensions of access to an overall healthy diet that I'll introduce now, and then getting from Lisa Moon a sense of how the food banking network is mobilizing and uh, successfully reaching people um, all, or, all around the world. So what is the measurement? Um, uh, Gal, next slide, lays out the story of food prices. So, so and you can advance one more to note that each successive food price crisis, these spikes that you see here, most recently the 2008 food price crisis, followed by a series in 2011, 2012, 2015, 16, most recently these two successive uh, very harmful crises of high food prices. You see the dark blue line is the relative price of food in the United States compared to all other things. And then the dotted line is around the world, the average of the food CPI consumer price index for each country relative to their overall consumer price indexes. There's some synchronization around the world. Each country has a slightly different situation. And you can see how these food price crises trigger a wave of food insecurity and consequent disruption. So the next slide lays out how we've analyzed that. So as Gal mentioned at the beginning, a long history of concern just about calories for survival. And in the United States, even this was an important issue in the past. And in the 1960s, the FAO around the world was able to begin measuring this everywhere through what they call the prevalence of undernourishment, just to track are people getting enough energy. And the next bullet point tells you how went beyond that, led by the US and the US Department of Agriculture in particular in the 1990s to uh, build on some early research in the 1980s um, and then roll out these measures of the experience of food insecurity. And these experience of food insecurity scores count the number of people who went to bed hungry or skipped meals or ate less, less, less or fewer items. Um, and, uh, or in the United States question, we asked, did you eat, were you able to eat a balanced diet for lack of money to buy usual foods? And Alicia is gonna give you the details on that. But then in the next bullet, in recent years, what we've been able to do is to take data on every retail item being sold at a particular marketplace, so hundreds or even thousands of items, um, match them to their food composition, and ask to what degree does the price of these items allow people to have, to acquire an overall healthy diet within their available income. And since 1920, uh, sorry, 2020, with the uh, UN agencies, the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, IFAD, UNICEF for Children, the World Food Program, WFP, and the World Health Organization, WHO, we've been able to build out metrics, this, this measure of the cost and affordability of an overall healthy diet that's been used in the State of Food Security Nutrition Reports in the last three years. The next one for 2023 will come out in July. And that allows us to measure the affordability of healthy diets, distinguishing between causes of malnutrition. So the next bullet tells you that if prices are, next bullet shows that if prices are relatively low, uh, uh, high, so foods are expensive, then you know that's the indication that the right action is to lower prices. But the next bullet tells you often prices are typical, but the incomes of a particular group of people are low. So then you need higher earnings or assistance. And this third bullet tells you that often food is actually available, but is crowded out by unhealthy foods that are substituted instead. So the next slide shows you how this works around the world. 
the costs of healthy diets in the green are relatively similar in low income and high income prices. The next bullet shows you how those prices are not low in poor countries. It's a roughly horizontal line. $3.31 is the global average for a healthy diet. $2.46 you can see on the right is for nutrient, just enough nutrients. And then energy is only 83 cents uh, per person per day. And the next bullet shows you that the next bullet shows you that the next bullet shows you how the average cost has been rising in recent years because of the COVID crisis that you saw at the very beginning. And about 3 billion people cannot afford an overall healthy diet. The next slide compares th these healthy diets that you just saw, the green uh, squares, for example, to the average actual cost, which is the black stars. Then the next bullet gives you this conclusion that spending is much lower than the cost of a healthy diet in poor countries, but much higher in rich countries. And the next bullet um, advancing tells you how much greater that, that is in the middle. But of course, that's the average. Not everyone can afford that. And what Alicia will share next is this granular measurement in the United States. And then Park will share how the qualitative analysis complements the quantitative measure and how we can drill closer into the US story uh, in the slides that Park will share after Alicia. So the next advance, go ahead, uh, um, compares prevalence of food insecurity to these affordability metrics. But let's go ahead to hear from Alicia right away. Can you advance? Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Will. And next, we will have Alicia Coleman Jensen. Alicia? Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. I'm happy to be here. Uh, you can advance to the next slide, please. So as Will said, I'll, I'll be talking about food security in the United States as measured by USDA. These are our food security definitions. So of course, we hope that all households are fully food secure, that, that they have access at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life for all household members. When households experience food insecurity, this means that they're unable at some time during the year to provide adequate food for one or more household members because of a lack of resources. So just let me unpack this a little bit. So at some time during the year, our statistics are most often annual statistics so that if a household experiences food insecurity at any point, that household would be considered food insecure for the year because we're trying to make sure that households have consistent access to enough food to eat. And then to provide adequate food for one or more household members. So in some households, food insecurity may be experienced differently across household members. And if any household member is food insecure, that entire household is classified as food insecure. This is especially important considering households with young children, for example, where parents may try to shield children from food insecurity to the extent that they can. And then finally, because of a lack of resources. So food insecurity is about not being able to afford enough food. Um, this is not about dieting or um, you know, not having enough time to eat, things of that nature. Very low food security is the more severe range of food insecurity, where normal eating patterns of some household members were disrupted at times during the year and their food intake reduced because they could not afford enough food. So very low food security is indented here to, to show that this is a subset of food insecure households and the more severe range of food insecurity. Disrupted eating patterns means that they're skipping meals and more severe situations going a whole day without eating. Next slide, please. So we measure food security with a household survey. It's the current population survey food security supplement. As Will mentioned, this is about people's experiences of food insecurity. So we ask people about their food security. The gradient here represents the severity of food insecurity. So we ask questions across the severity from um, you know, relatively less severe um, experiences of food hardship to relatively more severe. So for example, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. Was that often sometimes or never true for you in the last 12 months? If someone responds that was often or sometimes true, that would be considered an affirmative response. 
and we sum the number of affirmative responses to determine household food security status. Now there is um, you know, measurement theory and a measurement model underlying this. Um, I'm not gonna go into depth on that, but we have information on our website about that and in our annual food security reports. So we couldn't afford to eat balanced meals. Did you ever cut the size of your meals or skip meals because there wasn't enough money for food? And then the most severe item, did you ever not eat for a whole day because there wasn't enough money for food. So these are example items um, directed toward adults and the household as a whole. We also have items directed um, asking parents and caregivers about children's experiences. And those items are similar in content, but ask about the children's experiences. Next slide, please. So this shows, um, the graphic on the right shows the prevalence of food insecurity and very low food security from 2001 through 2021. Um, again, the top solid blue line is food insecurity, which ex includes low and very low food security. And the distinction between low and very low food security is that low food security is typically characterized um, by a reduction in dietary quality or variety, whereas very low food security also includes reductions in dietary quantity. So the people telling us they're just not able to get enough to eat because they can't afford it. You can see that there was a slight decline in 2021 um, for food insecurity that was not statistically significant, but in 2021, 10.2% of US households experienced food insecurity. And there's a link um, to our uh, reports from our website. So just quickly, why do we measure and monitor household food security? So food security data are used for multiple purposes to assess and monitor well-being. They're measured as part of the sustainable development goals. Um, and USDA's food security measure um, really for, formed the um, backbone of the food insecurity experience scale, which FAO has been using to measure food insecurity globally. In the United States, food security um, monitoring is part of Healthy People 2030 objectives, and food insecurity has been identified as a leading health indicator for those help Healthy People 2030 objectives. Of course, we also use food security to measure the effectiveness of policies and programs that are targeted toward reducing food insecurity and improving outcomes. Um, and the food security measurement modules are used uh, by others, for example, the Food and Nutrition Service, in their evaluations of programs and by independent researchers. Next slide, please. And this just shows how to get in touch with ERS and um, find our content. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alicia. Next, we'll have Park Well. Thank you, thank you, Gal, and thank you, Alicia. It's great, it's great to be here. And of course, there's a big connection between household food security and the affordability of an adequate diet. And so I'll be talking about two things. One is a chance to share a little bit about some research that we're doing with support from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, or NIFA, at USDA. And the other is using this as kind of the news hook to, to talk about uh, the Thrifty Food Plan, just because um, understanding this important model diet that's connected with SNAP policy may be of interest to this audience. Next slide. So for our particular uh, research, um, we're using both qualitative and quantitative methods. I like the parallel structure between the constrained optimization models that I'll tell you about that are used in the Thrifty Food Plan, which have kind of an objective related to people's preferences and constraints related to the cost and to the nutrition quality, but also um, qualitative interviews, uh, ordinary interviews with ordinary people who, who patronize food banks and food pantries in four states around the country, just having a conversation with them about, in plain English, what are what are their aspirations and what are the constraints that keep them from achieving it? And, the, and here's a number of my uh, collaborators. The next slide, next uh, bullet. And uh, what I should mention is the disclaimer uh, it's always true that uh, USDA is not responsible for anything I say, but it's especially true when I talk about the Thrifty Food Plan because our model um, uses a similar, you know, we use a similar model, but it's not exactly the same as the official TFP. And so nothing I say should be uh, uh, considered to, to be a, a direct comment on SNAP policy. Uh, next. So among the great political divisions in the United States, perhaps a little bit lower than the difference between Republicans and Democrats is the difference between food price 
optimists and food price pessimists. So uh, some people figure, and this kind of illustrates the world as it would appear to a healthy food price pessimist, um, that, that uh, our food, food supply is divided into those foods that are ex healthy but too expensive and those foods that are uh, less healthy and affordable. Um, but if we hit the next slide, you can see that in some ways a, a food price optimist might see foods in all four of these quadrants, recognizing that sometimes food is healthy and sometimes food's less healthy, and uh, that happens at all price points. Next, please. And uh, so there's a long history in the nutrition science literature of looking at how food prices are related to healthfulness. Here is a, uh, uses the current, current NHANES data, the same data source used for the Thrifty Food Plan. And you can see um, uh, that, that uh, if we use um, energy density, you know, which might be connected to how obesogenic foods are, um, if, uh, how likely it is to make us gain weight, um, that the foods to the left that are less expensive may um, uh, be, be in general, may include more of the energy dense foods that, that we perhaps should be avoiding a little. And um, uh, if you hit the next slide though, you'll see that depending on what our definition of healthy is, sometimes the pattern is not so obviously pessimistic. I take uh, sodium, for example, how, how, how dense are different foods in sodium? And you notice there's no similar obvious pattern. Uh, at, at every level of um, cost of different foods, some are high in sodium, some are low in sodium. It's not particularly expensive to provide low sodium foods. And then you see quirks, like you think about a fairly high sodium food item like salad dressing, um, we could judge its healthfulness mistakenly if we just think about it on its own. The obvious thing about salad dressing is it goes with salad. And so, uh, uh, of course, healthy diets may uh, sometimes have a food product that, uh, that, that has a little more sodium in it if it's, a, if it's a complement to foods that are healthy, such as salads. Next. So when the USDA updated the Thrifty Food Plan in 2021, it was one of the biggest developments in nutrition assistance policy, probably in decades. Uh, it was the largest permanent increase in the SNAP benefit. And it arose because uh, USDA researchers who were tasked with updating the Thrifty Food Plan found that when they used the cost constraint, the inflation updated cost constraint that had been available from previous editions, it was not sufficient to have an adequate healthy diet. And so this led to increases in the benefit uh, for um, different demographic groups. It came out to about a 21% benefit increase on average. Next. And uh, the Thrifty Food Plan works like this. If you um, wanna choose a diet that for reasons of palatability and appeal is not too different from current consumption, but it has to be different enough from current consumption. You can't just pander to what current consumption is. It has to be different enough to be affordable and to be healthy. And next. It's, and then you get results somewhat like this, which illustrates what was the challenge that USDA faced as it updated the Thrifty Food Plan. Um, the distance function on the vertical axis says how different is the model diet from current consumption, where, where um, being higher on this graph might mean a diet is not liked as well because it's very, it requires people to change what they're eating. And as you look horizontally, you can see it's really inexpensive to find food that just gives uh, food energy, you know, enough calories. Will, Will pointed this out also. Um, getting enough energy and enough nutrients is intermediate amount of expense. And getting enough nutrients and having food that that um, sort of meets all of our expectations for what food groups do we get our food from, having enough meat, for example, and not just dried beans, um, then you find that it's just barely possible to find an adequate, affordable uh, diet. And it requires people to, it requires the model diet to be quite different from what people currently want to consume. And so this is the big challenge for SNAP and for nutrition assistance policy. I so forward look, to look I so look forward to Lisa's um, observations related to this um, from the perspective of somebody who works on uh, glo glo global um, charitable nutrition assistance. Thank you very much, Park. Lisa? Yes, thank you, Park, and um, to Alicia and to Will 
for the great comments prior to this, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Gail. Thank you. Um, so we use all of the data that has been discussed um, previously really to think about how we can be targeting more of our programmatic intervention, um, obviously from a nonprofit perspective. Um, and so uh, many of you attending likely know uh, what the food banking model is um, because it is very well known in the states. And of course, it looks at the community level. Is there surplus product available that would be nutritiously desirable to people that may not have access to it and then uses a nonprofit model to redistribute that product to people facing hunger. Um, and uh, it's generally a charitable endeavor. And, uh, and of course, food banks tend to work with food producers all across the supply chain from farmers down to even retailers and food service to be thinking about this food that would otherwise be lost or wasted, how we can keep it in the human supply chain to improve food access. Um, you go to the next slide, please. Um, so food banks in high income countries have existed for more than 50 years. Um, but what we have seen over the past 30 is that this, there has been significant interest in this model at the community level um, in many places around the world. And so the organization that I work for looks specifically to connect, connect food banking organizations in emerging and developing markets. And so all of the organizations that we work with, which now spans nearly 50 countries, um, he had he had this idea almost, you know, indigenously, they were they were seeing that there was a significant amount of surplus going to waste at the same time, looking at the need in their communities. And we're curious, how can we put these two challenges together? And so what this map shares really is that in addition to the United States and Europe, where this model has been around for, for many decades, food banking today is being carried out um, in total of more than 70 countries. Um, and what's very, I think, unique about, um, about the model is that it's very adaptable depending on the community where, where it's based. And I wanted to take a few minutes just really to talk about how this model, as it seeks to improve food access, looks different um, than what we might be used to seeing in the United States. Um, and the first is, is that it's very focused on surplus food recovery. There tends to be um, less purchasing of food in emerging and developing markets. Um, the second is, is th that um, normally these organizations do not enjoy um, um, government support. Um, so they're nearly entirely independent um, of government, and that includes even the policies in, in many places actually make it easier, um, less expensive to throw food away than it is to, to donate food. Um, and then the third thing is that it's a much um, more flexible supply chain model. The, um, the organizations are really relying more on technology and existing supply chains, as opposed to building out an entirely separate supply chain um, that is more kind of unique just to the charitable sector. Um, so as you can see today, uh, there's a very significant geographic footprint. Um, and if you were to add the numbers, of course, presented here are the the organizations just served by um, the organization that I lead. But if you were to look at the number of people globally that's accessing um, food in some way through a food bank, um, it would be over 90 million people. So next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit just about the clients that food banks are serving. Um, and traditionally, uh, most of our focus has been on kind of that on food, food insecure populations, not necessarily severe food insecurity or those facing chronically undernourishment, but more people that need to have additional support to access a nutritious diet. And so because of that, most of the food banks in our network traditionally have focused on how do we source through surplus you know, food streams, those highly desirable products that might be too expensive for a regular family to access. Um, so, for example, last year, the majority of the sourcing and distribution of food banks in our network was around fruits and vegetables. 15% um, uh, of it was looking mainly at um, dairy and other types of proteins. Um, and then we have a small segment focused on basic grains. Um, but I think that what's been very exciting for us about this is that kind of focusing on those higher 
quality, nutritious foods, fresh where possible, um, we're able to engage with a lot of different players than, than, um, than we normally would have had a chance to do. And I'm just thinking specifically about, you know, our, our partner in Kenya and Nairobi, they actually are sourcing almost exclusively from commercial um, produce farms that are growing for export. And there's been an enormous amount of surplus, um, not so much the last 12 months, but um, since their genesis five years ago. And because of that, they have been able to um, form terrific partnerships with those growers specifically around fruit and veg and be distributing that kind of to their clients, um, uh, many of whom are also smallholder farmers. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide. In some cases though, food banks are also serving clients that are severely food insecure or chronically undernourished. And in those cases, the organizations are focused on providing more of a complete picture of nutrition. Um, I think a best example of this is what our members are carrying out as it relates to school feeding. Um, so school feeding programs are being conducted by food banks completely independent of government in 36 countries, uh, supporting uniquely 26,000 children. Um, and in those cases, all of those children Children would be um, classified as uh, moderately or severely food insecure. Um, the last point, and I'm just going to have you skip two slides, Gail, please. Um, I just want to make uh, a point, and Will, this really speaks to what you started off talking about, which is that, you know, so a lot of times food insecurity can be caused by um, income, and, uh, you know, the price of food tends to be affordable per se, but maybe people have um, lower incomes. But I think what we have seen over the past couple of years is that it, we are having to change our model significantly because the, the cost of food and just the cost of of living in general has increased. Um, and so that conflated with a number of natural disasters that are being carried out. We are seeing that um, the a rise, a percentage rise in clients who used to only need complementary food support to needing food support for even the most basic of staples. And so I think this really gets parked into your points about what are some of the government policies that can be in place to make sure you're providing a holistic foundation um, of food access um, for all those, those key staples. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, before we wrap up, we encourage you to sign up to our newsletter where you will get more information on similar event online at seafair.org. And also follow up on us on various uh, social media outlets. Just search our name, the Council on Food, Agricultural and Research Economics. Uh, follow us on Twitter and feel free to send us any inquiries or questions or queries to information at seafair.org and we will be happy to address it and do our best to answer your questions. Very important before we wrap up, we want to offer a big thank you to our partners. This and other Seafair programming events would not be possible without the continuing support of the Agricultural and Applied Economic Association, AAEA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Statistical Service, NAS, as well as the USDA Economic Research Service, ERS. Your support is highly valuable to us and very helpful in continuing our um, work. We want to offer a big thank you again to our panelists for a very interesting discussion. Lastly, we want to thank you, the audience. Uh, all of us are passionate about this topic, and we think you are too, but it's not a small thing to give an hour of your time to sit down and listen. We hope you enjoyed this event as much as we enjoyed hosting it, and thank you so much, and have a great day.